Hello. Thank you. That goes to Dylan Beatty. Uh, he's great. He's a great speaker, by the way, uh, and he's also a great musician, as you can all uh, had a chance to hear. Um, he has more of those. Just Google it. Um, you're not going to be disappointed. I hope this sets the mood after the lunch break. Right? Um, but if you still feel sleepy, that's OK. I'm going to be talking about things for the next five, uh, 50 minutes. So you can listen to me, or you can take your nap. <laughs> Works both ways. What I'm going to be talking today is location transparency. And literally everyone I met uh, during the uh, conference, and not this one, but pretty much any conference where I do this talk, is like, we'd never heard of it. I was like, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> that's the whole problem. Um, so we're going to explore what that thing is, why it is important. Um, if you attended my earlier talk today, which was kind of a surprise, I only learned I'm going to be doing two talks yesterday evening, um, there will be overlapping things. So uh, I'll, some of the things that I'm going to mention during this talk, you've probably, those of you who were in the earlier session, probably you've seen them already. Nevertheless, I'm going to, uh, I hope I'm, I'm going to be able to show things to you from different perspective. Um, and bring more value to the pretty much same conversation. So reintroducing myself, I'm Milan Jankov. I work for Exonic, and Exonic is a company that builds software for software developers. We have a framework and a server that helps developers implement domain-driven design, event sourcing, and secure risk. And I'm a developer advocate, which means I bridge the gap within our developers who are building the frameworks and the people like you who are using the framework. So that's about me. That's where I live. That's my house. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a, in a city. It's very close to you know, all the um, um, uh, educational facilities and also to the pubs. And my kids love it. Uh, but my wife does not feel really good there. She's a, um, a seaside person. And uh, she wants to live by the sea. So what we did is we chop the piece of the house, and we move it on the seaside. And now she's living on the beach, and she's super happy about it. Well, that doesn't work for me well. I don't really like the beach. I like mountains. And uh, I was like, I always dream to have a house higher in the mountains somewhere. So I chopped another piece of the house and moved it in the mountains. And this is where I live. And now everyone's happy. You know, kids are happy, my wife's happy, I'm happy. The only challenge is when we go for a family dinner, we have to drive several hundred kilometers. But hey, who cares? Like, you know, did you buy that story? No, OK. Let me give you another one. That's my application. It was a beautiful monolith, working just fine. Everyone was happy, except that some pieces could benefit from some optimizations. So I got a few of those pieces and deployed them independently. And now you know they are in two different environments. And then I got a few more pieces, and I deployed them independently, and they live somewhere else. And uh, they are very happy, integrated with each other. And I have a beautiful microservices-style distributed application. Did you buy that story? Much more believable, isn't it? All right? Because you don't see all these things behind, right? The, all the interconnections, you know, all the components that needs to talk to. No, that's, that's not on the beautiful diagrams that we draw. Right? We just expect this to automatically work somehow. Right? So when I was preparing this uh, analogy for another occasion, what struck me is why? Why it is that when I tell the story about the house, you can immediately sense the nonsense. I was like, yeah, that's not, no way that's going to work. I was like, no. You can immediately tell I'm telling you, you know, fake things, right? But when we talk about software architecture, the very same approach is believable. It's, yeah, let's go, let's do it, right? Why? So I personally think it has a lot to do with coherence. And our ability, our as a human beings, ability to sense coherence in real life objects. You can immediately tell if things are coherent or not when it comes to 
to, to yourself, to your family, to your house, to your personal belongings, to the physical objects of the world. And we don't have that ability when it comes down to software. So what is coherence? Coherence is when things make sense together, right? Like on that picture, that's a, a, a transportation uh, thing, a train, let's say. If you travel, right, and you go to the train station and they tell you, you go and board that train, and your code boards that train, and then you have to pick up your personal belongings at, you know, at the end station, you would be like, no, that makes no sense. Right? My personal belongings travel with me. That's why you have these racks where you can put your luggage, uh, you know, you, these places where you can put your code, and stuff like that. Uh, right? It, it's just coherent. It makes sense that you and your uh, personal belongings are together on that trip. Right? You don't split it there, right? But in software engineering, the term that we use most often is not actually coherence, but coupling. We talk a lot about coupling, coupling things, right? And decoupling things. And coupling is different. You couple things, bring things together, because it, in some circumstances, in some environment, it makes sense. To give you an example, the train cars are coupled. They are tied together, right? Many of them. And that's done for the reason that there is a single engine that can uh, power and brings many of those cars. But what you can theoretically do is you, you can at any time decouple them. You can split them apart and put an engine in front of each of those cars. And you will receive the exact same result, meaning the passenger will be driven to, the final, to their final destination. Now, the reason we couple things together is because it makes sense for optimization, performance, whatever else uh, purposes, but we do that on purpose to achieve a goal. And when we couple things, we typically can decouple them, right? Which is not the same as coherence. Coherence just it's, it makes sense together, and it makes no sense to not be together, right? So let me introduce yet another word, and that's kinescence. How many of you have heard of, ever heard of kinescence? Two, three people. OK, that's the usual. Um, so kinescence, the first time I heard that word is from that book. Uh, it's uh, Fundamentals of Object-Oriented uh, Design in UML by Mailer, by, uh, Mailer Page Jones. And how he describes kinescence is when two things are uh, bound to live and die together. Born, live, and die together. What do we, what do we mean by that? Is, uh, an example would be a train, truck, and the wheels, right? So those are two independent things, probably most likely produced by different manufacturers. The people who produce the train trucks are not the same people who produce the trains. But there is a connaissance. If you, put, if you make narrower or wider tracks, you have to design the wheels of the train to be narrower or wider. There is a connection between those two. You can't change one without changing another, or things will not work, right? So that's what kinescence is all about. It's the act of functioning or bringing it or, or living together, if you will, uh, because things need to, needs to match. Right? So to go back to code, there's a very simple piece of code on the screen. <coughs> <I'm> sorry. <coughs> it's essentially a function or a method or whatever you want to call it um, that accepts an argument and does something. It's part of a, a, a ticket purchasing uh, system for attractions. So there are attractions. You can purchase tickets for, for attractions. Do you see any connaissance in that code? Probably not, so let me help you out. It's the name. So you can't change main attraction to be something else in one place and not changing in the other. You know, if you change the declaration, the definition, the first time usage, then you have to go and change it everywhere where it appears in the code. Now, you don't really care about things like that because we are today unlike the whole history that we saw in the video earlier, uh, at the stage where those things are taken care of for us by IDEs. You just use the refactoring function of your IDE, and it does the work for you. So 
it's not a problem for a developer to do so. Nevertheless, the connaissance is there. There is a connection. There is another connaissance in that very same code. Can you spot it? It's the type. You cannot change the type of the attribute or parameter of whatever or a field without changing everywhere in the code where that field or, or, or attribute or variable is being used. Right? So you have a connaissance of type. Right? Every time you change type in one place, you have to change it in another place as well. And again, we don't really pay too much attention to these things because that, again, is another thing that IDs take care uh, of us. So connaissance of name and connaissance of type are those connaissances that we uh, call a low-level connaissance. That's, that's, that's something that's always there, and we can deal with that, and it's not a big deal, typically. But look at that code. It's a little bit more complicated. So now we're not buying a ticket for one attraction, but we're buying a ticket for multiple attractions, one of which is the main attraction. Right? And so you have this function or method that um, uh, attaches this, uh, builds that data structure, and then you have the code that calls that method. Do you see any connections there? Let me help you out. It's a connections of algorithm or connections of convention. So your assumption or logic or algorithm in the method is that the first element of that list is the main attraction. Now, every single piece of code that uses your function or method needs to know that. Because if they pass you the main attraction as a second argument, that's not going to work. So the piece of code that does something and a piece of code that asks that other piece to do something, they have a connaissance. They share a common understanding of an algorithm or a convention. We can make that more explicit. You can have your method having, a func uh, having a, an, uh, an argument that is the main attraction and then is the, a list of the other attractions. Right? And then, again, call it the same way. Now it is explicit, isn't it? Well, yes, and that's what we call a connaissance of position. What if you want to change that the, you first provide all the attractions and then the last argument is the main attraction? You cannot make that change without changing the entire code because the way it is being used uh, it, it introduces a connaissance of position. The both sides of the equation needs to know w on which exactly position they need to provide the information. There's a lots of different types of connaissance, and I'm not going to go through all of them. This was just a few examples so that you can grasp what we're talking about here. There's a connaissance of execution, which means that a certain pieces of code needs to go before or other pieces of code, otherwise things break. Uh, as connaissance of timing, which is especially important if you do um, real-time operations. A connaissance of value, when uh, two different things need to receive exact same value or things breaks, or they need to link to the exact same object, which is a connaissance of identity. And there's also a thing called contranescence, which is something that we totally don't think about as a problem, but it exists. And an example of that is naming things. If you name a method, a variable, a function, whatever, you cannot use that name for anything else. Right? And that's a limitation. If you call your method something, you cannot have another method called something, well, Java. The, there's more, a little bit more complicated, but you get the idea, right? If you can call a variable something, you cannot use another variable called something which serves different purpose, right? And that's what contranescence is. By designing things in a, in a certain way, you're also introducing limitations about further things you may want to design. So now that we know what a connescence is, and the natural question that pops up is, is that because there is coherence, or is that because there is coupling? What is causing this connaissance? Uh, can we break it, or can we, can we not break it? And the answer is typically you cannot. Connaissance typically is because things make sense this way, right? So 
There was this book called Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans, and where he introduced the idea of domain driven design a long, long time ago. And in this book, he defined something that he calls aggregate. So, an aggregate is a group of objects which are considered a whole, or a single unit, with respect to changes. So, in while modeling most of the things, we typically need more than one object to represent them. But the way we interact with, with, those, with, those, with this group of objects is typically through a single component. So internally, these objects can be interconnected in whatever way makes sense for the model, but from the outside world, they appear as a one thing. And so it has a root, which is the thing that you use to interact with the outside world, and it defines boundaries. So within those boundaries, the objects are connected, and outside those boundaries, they appear as one thing. Now, if you uh, compare the definitions of aggregate and, co and coherence, you'll see quite a lot of similarities. Right? It's the idea of having unified whole, uh, of, of a group of objects that appear as a unified whole, is the, the idea of things being logical, inconsistent within boundaries. The things are very, um, uh, very similar. So essentially, you use aggregates to, uh, to define mo um, the structures, models, that are internally very interconnected, meaning they have higher connaissance. All this stuff that you have, like algorithms and assumptions and um, you know, ordering and position and whatnot, that's totally fine within the aggregate, within the group of objects that are coherent because they have to be because that's, how, that, that, that's the way they make sense, right? It doesn't have to be an aggregate. It could be any group of object that you can introduce boundaries and, and represent as a, as a whole, right? And in there, you, you can have all kinds of higher connaissance uh, because it makes sense. Where you want to have lower connaissance, which means connaissance of name and connaissance of type, is when you interact between those objects. Because if you have a higher connaissance in there, things will become unmanageable sooner or later. You have independent components that one needs to know the logic of the other, that's begging for troubles in the future. So how do those things communicate? Typically, there's some piece of data that they exchange. Uh, and what you would want to do is to only have a connaissance of name and connaissance of type with respect to that data, because that's easy to deal with if something changes. So that's your lower level connaissance. Now, what about the arrows? Again, that's my, I always make fun of this because when we draw diagrams, we draw these arrows and then we assume they automatically work somehow. What about the location of those components? Is that a connaissance? That's not from the original book, but I argue there is a connaissance of location. And let me try to prove that to you. There is this code. There is a method called handle request, which receives a request and then calls a method called buy ticket and my ticket does something. That method, that, that code, the way you see it on the screen, has a connaissance of location. It assumes that the buy ticket call and a buy ticket method are in the same class. If you move any of those into a different class, that code immediately stops working. So, even though it's an obvious thing for you, there is an assumption behind the scene, but a one that you can easily fix by using a call to a different class and then call the method, and voila, there is no more connaissance. Or is there? There's a connaissance of package here, if you will, of, pa of location, of the, uh, the, pa uh, the connaissance of location with respect to package. These two will only work if they're in the same Java package. If you move one of those in a different package, that's not going to work, which is, again, easy to fix. You just add an import statement, and you import your package, and then all of a sudden, everything works fine, right? Well, now you have the assumption that both are on the same class path or module path, pick your Java version, 
Um, right? So there is another assumption in there that these are discoverable in some space, right? Okay, forget about Java. Let's go full web stuff, right? So we're just going to introduce a web service here. And there is a, uh, a URL where we're going to expose a web service, and then we're going to have a, uh, a RESTful client that's going to call that service, and no more this location crap, uh, Knessence thing, right? Well, first of all, then you need to have the very same configuration with respect to the server which, where the code is running. You cannot simply move that RESTful service to a different URL and expect your clients to work. Yeah, OK, I know. There are tons of discovery frameworks out there. You know, but why? That's, the, that's the, where we're getting, right? But you can go even, uh, and there is also, on top of that, there is also a connaissance of name, uh, which is the path, the port, and whatever else there is to discover that, uh, that service. But we can go even further down the road and can say, let's use uh, some sort of a messaging uh, a message router. Uh, and then we're going to have either topics or queues or whatever the term is. Uh, and then we're just going to send something on that topic, and someone's going to receive it. And we're con completely like, uh, uh, detached. Well, then you have the assumption that both sides are connected to the same topic or stream or w whatever the thing is. It's even worse, because it's now a connaissance between three parties. It's the, cons the producer, the consumer, and the thing in the middle that does the routing. So you have those names in three places. And no matter which one changes, you got to go and change the other two. So what I argue is that all those are Connaissance of location, or in other words, they introduce location awareness. You may not think of it that way while you code, but there is a location awareness. Your components are aware of where, whether, where other components are. right? And that makes things uh, hard to change. We had five examples here. And if you want to go from the first to the last, right? that's quite a lot of thinking quite a lot of designing. How do I go from the assumption everything is in the same class to the assumption everything is on different virtual machines somewhere in the cloud? Right? There's quite a lot of mental effort to move from one point to another. And all this because under the hood, you have this location awareness. So if we agree there is a connaissance of location, what we can do to mitigate that, or in other words, how can we introduce a location transparency so that our components do not need to be aware of where, whether, uh, where other components are? Well, let's focus on that piece, data, in the middle. So we just call it data, but typically people will call it messages. Right? There's a message, and a system sends a message to another system. And when you put it that way, um, it kind of um, uh, makes more sense, but it's still too broad, too uh, generic, if you will. Because there are different types of messages which needs to be handled in different ways. And if you don't talk about messages, but split those into those three types, like commands, events, and queries, then things become more clear. Then you can actually examine each of those and figure out what, is the important, what are the important characteristics of each of those. So for commands, you typically want to route them to a single handler. Right? You don't want to route them to pretty much everyone out there, because you need one to handle it. And you need some sort of confirmation that this is working or not working. Someone's going to be doing something or not doing something. Right? For events, you want to distribute it to pretty much everyone out there. Right? And you don't expect any response, any result. You just notify things have happened, and that's it. It's going to fire and forget. When you deal with queries, it is the uh, result, the response, that is the most important part. That's the thing that you are interested in. You say, I want to know x, and the fact that you want to know it's not that important, 
the one who tells you what you want to know and is the important part, right? So this is how they differ. In terms of delivery, you either deliver to one or multiple, uh, or, or you do it selectively. In terms of uh, uh, f feedback, feedback communication, you may, know, you may expect no feedback, no response at all, or you may expect single confirmation or an ID or something, or you may expect a full-blown object with you know, data that's valuable to you. So if you just call them messages and put them all in one, that's very hard to design the things that they work well in all those three scenarios. So let's go and see some examples of how can we theoretically build those. Let's go and represent those three types of messages as Java classes. And those are plain POJOs. So here you have a issued uh, ticket command, which is a command. You have a ticket issued event, which is an event which notifies that a ticket was issued. And then you have a ticket attraction query, where you can, which you, um, you can use to ask the system uh, for which attractions this ticket applies. And then the last one also provides the information of what is the response type that you expect, which in this case is a ticket attractions response. So that's it, plain Java objects. Basically, we model your, uh, our um, uh, messages in a way that we know what they are. Now, if you have a message router that can understand those basic types of messages, it can provide you with the tools to send and receive them. So on your producer side, you would normally tell the message router, I'm sending this type of message. Please do something meaningful with it. And here is an example code. Uh, so the um, message router system, in this case, provides you with these gateways. And it, there is a command gateway. And so you construct your command object. Right? And then you send it. In this case, a, it is a synchronous operation, so you send and wait. You can also send it and uh, receive uh, a synchronous confirmation. There's also this thing called event gateway, where, which you can use to publish events, uh, the things that has happened. And there is a query gateway, which is uh, where you, um, let me get the cursor out, uh, which is where you uh, send requests for information. All right? And that's it. That goes to the message router. And the message router goes like, oh, that's a command. Who can handle that command? OK, I have these components who can handle these types of commands. So let me pick one, because I know command is only handled by a single uh, thing. And let's deliver it there. Or that's an event. Let's send it to everyone who has registered to receive such events. Or that's a query, let's figure out who can answer that. And maybe that's one component, maybe that's multiple components that needs to be cured, and then the data needs to be merged and, and returned back. That depends, on, again, on, on, on your configuration. But that's the smartness of the router. It knows how to deal with those types of things. But in order to do that, it needs to uh, allow the consumers to register themselves and tell what they can do. So here is an example of the consumer side, which basically uses an annotation on a method and basically say, hey, I am a command handler, and I can handle issue ticket command. And then if such command is received, route it to me, and I'll deal with it. Or I'm an event handler, and I can handle a ticket issued event. And if such event is received, Send it to me, and you know, I'll do something about it. Similar with the query. I can handle this type of query, and if it comes, I'll provide it with the result. And so your consumers are basically registering themselves with this um, just uh, enough, just smart enough message router uh, to basically tell what they can do. At no point, the message router cares about the actual message. It does not do any introspection of stuff. It basically, kn it basically knows the types and the routing patterns. And so that's how you introduce location transparency. From this perspective, 
no element, no, no object, no, uh, no item of the system needs to know where another item of the system is located. So the connaissance within the objects, within those aggregates or groups of objects, becomes irrelevant. You can have a higher level connaissance in the, within the boundaries, and then the connection between those is very, very low connaissance. It's essentially a connaissance by name and connaissance by type. And that's what we do here, and I'm kind of missing up, mix, mixed up the slide something, but yeah, okay, so the, the framework that we have, the Axon framework, is, is designed to do exactly that, to give you the ability to use domain-driven design, to design your models in a way that within the model, within the aggregates, there is any higher connaissance that you uh, need to have because there is a coherence there, and it, that's the place where you don't want to split things apart. But in the communication between those components, if you use Axon Framework, then you have essentially a connections of name and connections of type. And as you saw, those are just Java objects, which means if things change, you can just go to your IDE and say, I want to rename that type, I want to rename that um, um, a variable or something, and IDE is going to take care of that for you. right? And now, you can grab all this thing and deploy it in one single deployment unit. And if you configure it properly, and behind the scenes, you will even not have any serialization and deserialization and, and stuff like that. It would be essentially Java calls, right? But what you can also do is you would now, you know now where is the high connaissance. It's within the aggregates, within the components. Don't break there. But those communication style things, you can uh, break there. You can split them apart there because there is a low connaissance. So you can introduce a distributed message router in the middle, such as Axon Server or uh, Axonic Cloud. And without changing a single line of code in your application, you can now communicate with components which are distributed, which are located somewhere else. Now the routing, now you have to deal with serializing, deserializing, and you know, all the things that, that distributed computing needs uh, uh, in order to function properly. But from the logic of your code, from the model of your domain, the things will not change. Because you've already designed it in a way that you know which parts needs to stay coherent, and we don't split there and which part are just coupled for convenience reasons, and we can decouple them, right? So that's essentially what we try to do. One of the things we try to do with our products is to allow you to do uh, these things. So location transparency, in my personal opinion, is the key for doing uh, efficient uh, uh, distributed systems in an efficient way. And uh, if you put DDD event sourcing in CQRS, into the mix, and you have the tools that makes it easy to work with those, uh, then with time, things become clearer. You start seeing the objects that make sense to be together versus the objects that are coupled because it was convenient once upon a time. And you can make better decisions about whether uh, can we split it here or can we not, right? So. That's pretty much what location transparency is, and that's how we deal with it. Uh, and uh, I thank you very much for attending this talk, and I hope it wasn't too big of a surprise, uh, but uh, still you learned something. I'm uh, very uh, glad, would be very happy to hear your feedback. Uh, that's my email and my Twitter, and you can find me on all the other networks, whichever one is your favorite. Please uh, let me know what do you think. And there are a few links about other products uh, and services that we have in case you want to, to learn more. Again, thank you very much for attending today. And I think we still have like five minutes for questions. <laughs>